Hello, everyone, and welcome to Johnny's Ambassadors Expert Webinar Series for Parents. I'm your host, Laura Stack, the founder and CEO of Johnny's Ambassadors, where we educate parents and teens about the dangers of today's high THC marijuana, particularly on adolescent brain development, mental illness, and suicide. Johnny's Ambassadors was started in 2020, six months after our son Johnny died by suicide after becoming psychotic from using high potency marijuana concentrates. We have another incredible expert with us today to explain more on this topic and I will introduce her in just a moment as we go over a couple quick logistical details. This session is being recorded. Please share this important information with your friends and family on the same page where you registered. Uh, you will find the recording probably tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Gabi has provided handouts of her slides, which are in the control panel in the handout section, or if you're watching this recording, they are on this same page where you are watching the recording. Uh, Dr. Gabi will present with slides on her webcam for about 45 minutes, after which time she will take your questions. Those of you lucky enough to be in the live session for the last 15 minutes of her presentation. So there is a questions box in your control panel. As you think of your questions, as she does her presentation today, please type those into the question box. And at the end of her comments, I will take down her slides and I will interview her reading your questions. So please make sure to get those in as soon as you think of them so that we have time to ask your questions. So I would love to introduce a, an incredible uh, award-winning, famed, a uh, highly reputable cannabis expert with us today, Dr. Gabriella Gobby. We're so thrilled um, to have her. She is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University and leads a laboratory of basic science, neurobiological psychiatry unit, and works as a staff psychiatrist at the Mood Disorder Clinic of the McGill University Health Center. Dr. Gobby received her MD and her specialty in psychiatry and psychotherapy from the Catholic University of Rome in Italy. She also earned a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Calgary, Italy, and finalized her postdoc at McGill University in Montreal, Canada in 1998. Gabriella, we are so thrilled to have you with us and thank you for being one of Johnny's ambassadors. Thank you everybody for uh, your participation and thank you Laura very much for your invitation. So today uh, we talk uh, mostly about the link between cannabis and mood disorder, depression and suicide. First of all, why I'm so interested in this uh, topic. In uh, 2001, when I started my career as a psychiatrist here in Quebec, I was observing a lot of uh, young patients with uh, depression, as well as with a long-term can cannabis consumption. So at that time, I start to think about maybe there is a link between a cannabis in adolescence and depression. And uh, in the literature, in, at the beginning of 2000, there was very, very little about cannabis and depression. There were a lot of studies demonstrated that cannabis uh, triggers schizophrenia, but nothing about depression and suicide. Then in 2003, in my laboratory, a basic laboratory, I started to study the relationship between cannabis and uh, uh, depression, as well as the link between cannabis and serotonin, that is uh, the neurotransmitter implicating depression. Since then, we published more than 30 scientific articles on the topic. I was also expert witness in the Parliament of Quebec to uh, help to pass a law about the increase of legal age of cannabis consumption. And we were successful because in Quebec now you can start cannabis only at age 21. And more recently, also in the Superior Court of Quebec to regulate the advertisement of cannabis. So let's go next. 
So first of all, uh, today I will explain uh, what is depression, what is a suicide, why does cannabis trigger depression and suicide, and how you can treat an adolescent who consume cannabis. So let's start with uh, a story, a story of a patient, I give a fantasy name not to be recognized. This is one of example of hundreds of patients that uh, in, my, in my career I see suffer from depression linked to cannabis. Jacques was an 18 years old exchange student at McGill. He was brought to the emergency of the Montreal General Hospital by police who saw him standing too close to the subway for a long time. So he was hearing voices asking him to jump. Just the day before uh, uh, of this episode, Jacques consumed a lot of cannabis at high concentration. When he arrived at the emergency, he had a suicidal ideation, severe symptom of depression, insomnia, anxiety, lack of appetite, pessimistic idea, lack of concentration for the previous two months. And he had also psychotic feature, that means he was uh, delusional, he was uh, hearing voice in, her, in his head. So the things that stuck me that was an absence of depression in the past and no mental issues in, the, in his family. So Jacques was born in the south of France, was uh, an adopted child, his mother is a nurse, his father an accountant. At age 14, Jacques started smoking cannabis first occasionally, occasionally means once a month, especially in a social context. Cannabis was helping him to better socialize, to be with his friend, to be more euphoric, to feel relaxed. Then at 17, he started smoking cannabis every week. And at age 18, when he moved to Montreal, he tried cannabis at very high potency, about THC 30%, that was offered by his older roommates. His mood in the last months became worse and worse until having this episode of a suicidal uh, attempt. So let's, uh, let's go to see what is a depression now. Depression is not only an emotional state of the mind, but it also includes also physical symptoms. Among the emotional symptoms, we have sadness, loss of interest or pleasure, feeling to be overwhelmed, anxiety, irritability, diminished ability to think or concentrate, indecisiveness, excessive and appropriate guilt. And uh, for example, for adolescents, young people, the incapacity to follow school or to follow university can be one of the first symptoms of depression. Among the physical symptoms, especially in young people, we have sleep disturbances, fatigue, back pain, significant change in appetite with, uh, with weight loss. One important thing of uh, depression is that when depression becomes very, very severe, people start to have a thinking of a suicide. So the suicide caused by depression is when you have a very severe depression for a long time, but also if you have some psychosis with delusion. And by chance, cannabis, we will see later, induce both, induce depression, as well as cannabis induces psychosis. When people start to hear voice or become paranoid, or hear voices that say you have to kill yourself. So we have always to watch these two symptoms in adolescent and young people because are a premonition of suicide. We know after many years of biological studies that serotonin is the most important neurotransmitter in the brain, is a molecule in the brain that is responsible of depression. So um, uh, serotonin, the neurons of serotonin are here and they spread in the prefrontal cortex and in the limbic system that is the brain system of emotion. 
So when we are depressed, the serotonin neurotransmission decreases. So what is a suicidal behavior? Suicidal behavior is, uh, is not only suicidal. There is a crescendo of a suicidal behavior. First of all, the people that suffer from depression start to have suicidal thoughts as a feeling that life is not worth living, feeling that you would be better off dead, or that a natural death would be welcome. Then the person, the patients, start to have a plan for suicide, start to consult the in internet for different options. And then in internet today, there are a lot of chat also advise you what is the best the best uh, manner to, uh, to commit a suicide. And then you have a suicidal attempt that is uh, uh, a tentative to do a suicide but without success, and the final suicide with death. So when we have somebody that is close to, to suicide or we can suspect that of suicide, we have uh, to look for some symptoms. One of these is, for example, talk or treat to harm oneself, the person verbalized that want to kill himself or harm, or looking a way to kill, uh, to kill oneself in internet. This uh, now is found in a lot of young people that commit a suicide. When uh, the coroner do the investigation, they find a lot of uh, sign, pre-sign pre, pre in, uh, in internet or just talking, writing about death and the suicide. Other warning sign of suicide is the increase of substance abuse, especially alcohol or cannabis, the feeling of despair, despair helplessness or hopelessness, no purpose in life, an increase in agitation, anxiety, as well as the disruption of sleep, other symptom also is the sensation to being trapped or the isolation, withdrawal from friends, from family, uh, acting in a very impulsive manner, as well as a dramatic mood change. What is the most likely person, what is the most likely person to commit suicide? Suicide rates are highest in teens. Today, in particular, United States, but also in Canada, we are seeing a huge increase of suicide among teens. Also, young adults and elderly are at risk. Suicide risk, in particular for uh, young people, is uh, higher when the person have attempted suicide in the past, the person use uh, uh, substance, uh, uh, substance as alcohol cannabis, as a family history of suicide. Very important for adolescent young people is also when somebody has a friend, a co-worker who have killed themselves. In adolescent, it's very important this imitation factor. If somebody in your environment uh, commit a suicide, you have more chances also yourself to commit a suicide. This is very important, especially for parents and school. And then people that are prone to impulsive behavior. So impulsi impulsivity is a risk factor for uh, um, suicide. Why does cannabis trigger depression and suicide? Let's start now to talk about a little bit more my particular research. We know that cannabis uh, contains uh, a lot of different uh, principles, about 100 uh, ingredients. But there are two ingredients that uh, they are the most important, most important. Delta 9, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC call, and cannabidiol, CBD. The THC is the bad guy, is the substance that give addiction, that give a high, and uh, is uh, very bad for health. CBD seems the good part of cannabis. It's supposed not to give addiction. It to be um, good for uh, epilepsy. It seems also for anxiety and probably also for pain. Cannabis today is uh, used in different uh, manner. The most common are uh, the joint, the blunt that contain more uh, uh, THC, and the spliff that is a mixture between uh, tobacco and cannabis. 
these are only three examples, but today the market is full of cannabis products from edibles, cookies, uh, resin, uh, etc. And we have also a lot of uh, chemical uh, uh, cannabinoids also in uh, use. So how does uh, THC work? THC, when you smoke a THC or vape THC, it goes immediately in the brain because it's very lipophilic. In the brain, a THC binds a receptor called CB1 receptor, cannabinoid receptor. This receptor is present in the brain because uh, uh, the brain is able to produce its own marijuana. Normal is called endocannabinoid. Our brain produces endocannabinoid in case of stress, in case of uh, disease, uh, inflammation. So the THC take the place of the endogenous uh, endocannabinoids. But unfortunately, the CB1 receptor is located also in the nuclei of serotonin. For this reason, probably when we smoke cannabis, when people smoke cannabis, as a very high high euphoria because the serotonin we see increase but in long term the serotonin decrease and you have depression is what we have demonstrated in our laboratory okay we published this work in 2007 uh, using um, synthetic cannabinoids you can see from this uh, graphic that low doses of cannabinoids increase serotonin but when you increase the doses of serotonin of a cannabis serotonin decrease so at the beginning for this reason at the beginning a low doses cannabis is good you have a high effect euphoric but as soon as you increase the dose you have the contrary because the serotonin decrease it probably this fall in a serotonin is linked to low mood is also linked to maybe also to psychosis so in our laboratory we did also another experiment we try to see what happened in a laboratory animal when they are treated during adolescent with the cannabis so animals uh, rats have uh, adolescence from day 30 to postnatal day 50 and then we also compare with the consumption of cannabis during adulthood. So what we found, we did some behavioral experiment in animals. We found that, that laboratory animals exposed to cannabis during adolescence, they have a sign of depression, measure also the decreased latency to immobility during the swimming but not in adults that consume cannabis during adulthood. Then we did another test that is the most, most test. So normally the laboratory animals, when he's happy, he prefer drink sucrose. But when he's depressed, in particular as anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, the lack of interest, he consumes less sucrose and more uh, water. <laughs> So indeed, what we see, we observe that adolescents that consume a lot of cannabis, they have a decrease of sucrose preference. That is a sign of anhedonia. And anhedonia is exactly what we see in patients after long-term use of cannabis. People really lose, lose the pleasure, look the pleasure to do interesting things, are more isolated the lack of joy in uh, their life. But we did also another experiment. We measure also the serotonin. So here you can see is the activity, electric activity of serotonin in uh, somebody that uh, did not consume cannabis. And here what's happened when an adolescent uh, consume cannabis. So you can see that the firing, the electric activity of serotonin, that is this very important neuron that regulates mood, decrease and become non-regular. And here you have the effect. We found also effect, another effect, even if it's smaller, also in adult, uh, in uh, a subject that consume uh, cannabis during adulthood. 
as if uh, also in adulthood, cannabis continue to have some effect in the serotonin system that is a system that regulates mood. So another reason also why uh, cannabis is so bad during adolescence and young adulthood is because the brain uh, has a, a development that starts at age zero until age 25. Very important, the brain uh, develops from the back to the front. So for the back, first uh, the adolescent de develop, develop the emotional brain and later in the 20 develop more the prefrontal cortex the frontal brain that is the brain that is responsible of uh, rationality moral value etc for this reason we think that adolescent they have this dysregulation of emotion so it is important to point out that if we introduce a drug of abuse that change the brain during the development of course the brain grow the brain development changes too we have more than 30 brain imaging studies that have demonstrate, demonstrated that the brain of adolescent, adolescent change after the use of cannabis. We have a really a lot of studies. More recently, some researchers have challenged these studies, say, no, you don't see the effect of cannabis, you see the effect of alcohol. It's true, it's true. This a change in the brain can be due to both cannabis and the alcohol. But don't forget that people that uh, consume cannabis consume al also alcohol and tobacco. So when we think about an adolescent that uh, uses cannabis, we have not just to think uh, this adolescent consume cannabis, another one alcohol, another one tobacco. No, are the same, are the same population that use this cocktail of cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. And all the three can change, of course, the brain. So in 2019, uh, we, we decided to go a little bit deeper in this topic, this topic, and we did a research in humans. We did a meta-analysis. The meta-analysis is a big study where you put together a lot of studies done around the world, the longitudinal studies, and you try to see if cannabis has an effect on depression, anxiety, and suicidality. So we uh, look at the longitudinal studies that uh, follow uh, kids from age 13, 18, and then looked at the outcome at age 21 and 30. We chosen only the study that control for premorbid depression. I mean, we want to study not the adolescents that were depressed here and then start to consume cannabis before depressed. We just choose the study control for the lack of depression at the beginning of cannabis consumption. And then we want to see what happened to adolescents that start just to use cannabis for fun. And then we want to see what happened, what happened later in life. So we analyzed 5,071 uh, work studies. And following this criteria, we found 35 studies, including qualitative analysis, and 11 studies, including this meta-analysis. So what we found, we found that cannabis increased by 37% the risk of developing depression later in life. And then we also look at the suicidal ideation. The suicidal ideation was a 50 time percent increase in suicidal ideation if you consume cannabis. We found also suicidal attempts, a suicidal attempts is a 300 times higher in cannabis. However, we have to take this number very carefully because there were a lot of heterogeneity among studies. Very interesting, uh, some colleagues, always Ian McGill, 
also did a similar study to us, but they went even further. They control also these studies, epidemiological studies, also for some genetic factor, just to see, to rule out that the genetics can confound the results. And what they found, they find that only cannabis, you see 0.044 is, means very significant, is direct, is a direct pathway to suicidal attempt, not alcohol, not smoking. So when people say, no, 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 alcohol is worse than cannabis, not, is not true. Cannabis regarding suicide is even higher than alcohol. Well, even control for genetic factors. So why these results are important? First, because our uh, study meta-analysis was controlled for premorbid depression. As I said before, we choose only children that at the beginning didn't have any kind of depression before starting cannabis. Then it's true, uh, the 1.37 that we found in our study is modest, it's not a big number, but you have to see this 37% among people that use cannabis in our society. We know that in the United States is about 20% of adolescents that report the consume of cannabis. 7% of them are also very daily users. So if you take this 1.37 and you put in a context of a lot of population that consume cannabis, the depression caused by cannabis in our society is very high in what that epidemiologists call population attributable risk. So a lot of parents at this point ask me how much is too much. So until now we don't have a very definite, definitive study say how much is too much. However, from all these uh, international large studies, we can say that weekly cannabis may have already effect on mental health. And uh, daily consumption of cannabis for many years undoubtedly has effect on mental health. You have to keep in mind that uh, cannabis is very lipophilic. Uh, when you smoke cannabis or you, you eat cannabis, stay in your body, it goes in your fat. So the THC can stay in your body also for one week or two weeks. So for this reason, people say, ah, just uh, smoke one joint a week. Yes, ma, one joint, one joint a, a week, it means that the THC in your body is for about one week or longer. Another factor to uh, consider uh, when uh, you assess somebody for the use of THC is the concentration of THC. So the more pronounced, uh, the more concentrated is a CHC, THC, the more pronounced the effect of mental health are. So today we are not like in uh, Jamaica with Bob Marley when the joint were three, five percent. Today, for example, in Quebec, you can buy joint at 30% of THC or vaping at 80% of THC. I think the same is, things is also in Colorado. So the THC present uh, today in the market, in the legal and illegal market, is very, very high. It is high potency THC that has more chances to produce effect on mental health. So these uh, very simple slides just uh, summarize why cannabis uh, produce uh, uh, is a far risk factor for suicidal. First of all, because cannabis, long-term use of cannabis can cause depression, a severe, severe, severe depression. Severe depression can induce suicide. Second, cannabis uh, was already uh, this, uh, this topic was already presented by other speakers here, Johnny Ambassador. Cannabis also produce uh, acute psychosis. Here I don't talk about the schizophrenia that is a chronic disease. If myself, I, I smoke cannabis uh, 
80% or 30%, I can have an episode of psychosis. I can think that uh, somebody asked me to kill myself and I can commit a suicide a few hours later. So these two factors are worsening in depression as well as the possibility to induce acute psychosis can be a factor for uh, suicide. So now let's see what uh, can you do if your child consumes cannabis. Let's give some uh, tips uh, to, to parents. First of all, take time to talk with the child, in particular with the adolescent or young uh, adult. It's not easy always to find the best moment uh, to talk with him because we know that uh, adolescents don't follow our schedule, they have their own schedule. So it's very important to spend a lot of time uh, with, uh, with our kids and find uh, the right moment to talk with them. Listen to their emotion, listen to their emotion to see if they are depressed, if they have uh, symptoms of depression or risk factors for depression, as I mentioned before. And uh, it's very important also the best way to predict uh, depression and suicide is the empathy. The more we can uh, really have a relationship of empathy with the person, with the child adolescent and with his or her emotion, we will be able to recognize the symptom of depression, sadness, despair. And then, of course, it's important to ask about consumption. How much uh, do you smoke? Well, which kind of cannabis? How often? What concentration level? Where do you buy it? And uh, once that we see that uh, our child can have a problem of depression and cannabis, of course, seek for medical and psychological help. So what a doctor can do for depression associated with the cannabis consumption? Okay, the, there are a lot, a lot of studies that say the most important strategy, strategy is the motivational therapy. Motivational therapy is based in uh, convincing, showing to young people that cannabis is very bad, which are the consequences. It's also important to explain, uh, to help uh, the adolescent to recognize also the symptom of cannabis dependence. For example, I see a lot of uh, young people say, ah, I'm not dependent to cannabis because uh, I can stop for one week. Okay, you stop for one week, but THC is in your body for one week or two. Did you try to stop for one month, for two months? What happened with you? And people start to say, yeah, then I become more irritable. I sleep very badly. So cannabis help me to sleep better. Say, no, but the fact that you sleep badly after stopping cannabis because you have a withdrawal symptoms, because one of the withdrawal symptoms from cannabis is sleeping badly or having irritability. So all this knowledge about uh, cannabis, uh, the symptoms of cannabis, the dependence of cannabis is very important to explain uh, to our children or, or patients in case of a uh, doctor. Another important uh, uh, therapy important for uh, cannabis consumption is cognitive behavioral therapy based on uh, several cognitive and behavioral strategy that the psychologist can offer to adolescent or uh, young adult. And then we have the pharmacology. If uh, somebody has uh, difficulties to uh, stop cannabis or have some withdrawal symptoms from cannabis, doctor can help by prescribing several uh, actual mood stabilizer and epileptic drugs as gabapentin, sodium valproate, lithium, lamotrigine, etc. So one important thing is that we know that the cannabis use is associated always with more depressive symptoms. 
I mean, if somebody consume cannabis and has depression, the depression is very, very bad. It can be also treatment resistant to different medicine. It means that the doctor has to try different uh, antidepressants, different therapies before find a good cocktail to be out from depression and cannabis consumption. However, the good, uh, the good news are that depression improves significantly when the patients stop cannabis. I saw a lot of patients in my career that once uh, they, they stop cannabis, uh, they have a good life, uh, the mood uh, is improved, uh, they're happy. Recently also I saw a patient, was, she was a woman, heavy smoker, and uh, during her uh, childhood, uh, sorry, during her adolescence, young adulthood, she received a diagnosis, diagnosis of ADHD. But when she stopped cannabis, also all the cognitive symptoms become, became completely normal. So I see that we, when patients stop cannabis, not only the mood, but so the cognition, the sleep, the anxiety, everything improves. Let's uh, come back to the story of Jacques. Then I had the chance to follow Jacques for a few months. After a few days spent at the emergency department, Jacques was dismissed follow as an outpatient. He was treated then with antidepressant plus antipsychotic and then started motivational therapy helping him to stop cannabis. I must say with Jacques was very easy because he was so scared about the episode that he had of psychosis, voices asking him to jump to the subway. He was so scared that he really understood that cannabis was a problem. He decided to stop. It was not easy for him to decrease cannabis because he, have, he had some withdrawal symptoms as a, a problem with the sleep, some agitation. But for about two weeks, some uh, gabapentin and benzodiazepine at night were prescribed to alleviate these uh, withdrawal symptoms. And finally, sorry, last but not least, psychotherapy. Then Jacques also started psychotherapy and followed the psychotherapy for about one year and then he decided to to go back in his country that was in Europe. So this is my last slide, so take home a message. So we know that basic clinical research uh, confirms that uh, the long-term effect of uh, adolescent cannabis consumption on depression, even in absence of uh, premorbid conditions, and the uh, cannabinoid interacts with brain areas involved in the re regulation of mood, such as serotonin and the endocannabinoid system. And the cannabis use disorder associated to depression can be cured and better even prevented. Thank you for your attention. I would like also to thank all my all these people that for about 20 years have worked in my lab at different time and uh, they have contributed to this uh, research about the link between uh, cannabis and depression. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. Um, Dr. Gobi, this is amazing. I love seeing your uh, research and especially hearing it from you in person. We have a lot of questions uh, from our attendees and I'll just start uh, off reading those in order if that's okay with you. Yes. Excellent. Okay, the first question is, uh, you mentioned the endocannabinoids. How mm -hmm. long does it take after the THC is stopped using, I think you mentioned a week or two, for their natural endocannabinoids to start production and for them to start feeling better again? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, good, very in interesting question. Actually, we don't have a research, until now we don't have a research that measure the level of endocannabinoids when somebody stop using cannabis. So we still, okay. uh, this is a good idea for research. Thank you. So, That's a good one for you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So what, what we know is very, very variable. Uh, cannabis can stay in the body for one week, two weeks. We see also cases that stay for one month. Wow. So before declare a person coming back to the normality, then I will say at least uh, one, two, three months, one, two, three months. Okay. Well, I had heard a mother uh, who shared that it took four months, actually nearly six months of her son not using cannabis uh, before they could start to wean him off of some of the antipsychotics yeah. to really see what they were dealing with in terms of how much damage had been done. And I had another mother report one year yeah. that it took have you heard of cases of it being that long a lot a lot it takes a long long time again we don't have as so precise studies of trajectories but this is exactly the experience that we see in our settings yeah okay okay great um at what age should people wait if they did want to start in other words at what age is it not as risky with brain development if they want to try THC? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, there is a study that was just published in at the end of 2018 in the UK. They tried to answer this question and they found the critical age is at 28. 28? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you the reference. Uh, is uh, everything that is before 28, there is this risk of depression. After 28, uh, you you st it means you start after 28, you can have some benefits of cannabis. Yeah. So the the lesson we would learn from what you're saying is, the longer they can delay, 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 put it off until 28 or older then the less mental harm they would have if their brain has been formed yes yes but again be careful to the concentration because in our emergency department we see a lot of 30 40 50 plus years old people they are having psychosis because of cannabis because so even in adulthood the psychosis, everybody is a risk of psychosis. Everybody is a risk of psychosis. Okay, yes. And you mentioned Colorado, and of course, you know that's where I live. Yeah. And our concentrates, most of them, you mentioned the vapes, we have the dabs and waxes, shatters, 80%, the distillates, 90%, crystalline, 99%, nearly pure. Um, so I imagine that your advice would be that it is in a dose dependent response, that the higher the dosage, um, and the younger the age with the higher frequency, even more danger. Would that be correct? Yes, exactly. You know, also Dr. De Forti also present about her own data. The strongest is uh, cannabis, uh, the more the risk of psychosis uh, are. Yeah. Which would lead to higher incidence, I imagine, of suicide because of your research. Um, yeah. Okay. Probably for okay for psychosis, we have already a lot of studies, as Dr. De Forti presented. For suicide, we still miss studies correlating the potency of cannabis to suicide. But that would uh, be another good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially now because this is new in our society. All the epidemiological studies that I present were collected 20 years ago. 30 years ago when still THC was low was a 6% oh. now we have a 30% 80% so we we see something today that was unexpected before so it it has to be magnified in many ways but that research needs to be done then with the higher potencies yeah um, wow it sounds like you have lots of work still yet to do yeah. 
<laughs> professor. <laughs> Dr. Gabi will be here in another 10 years telling us her additional research, everyone. <laughs> okay, um, what does motivational therapy look like, please? Okay, motivational therapy is, is quite simple. Um, for example, some doctors or parents can use, for example, with these uh, webinars uh, or material found, uh, serious material found in uh, in internet about explaining uh, the child what's really marijuana does in your brain, how much marijuana damage your brain. I have uh, some colleagues of mine, they provide a scientific article or a lay article to their patients. They try to uh, disrupt all these uh, fake news that people have uh, in their uh, culture, just to step by step convince people what is really the evidence of science, of pharmacology today about uh, cannabis. It seems like you must have a, a real uphill battle there in Canada with it being legalized nationally. And of course, we're facing that as well in the US with, um, and you have such an epidemic of youth use there because, hey, if it's legal, it must be safe, right? Yes. Uh, it's, it's natural. Well, it's, it's, it's harmless. So do people, you know, do you get a lot of mean, emails and nasty comments and people telling you that your science is wrong and you know is that something that you deal with all the time uh, no actually good question for people no uh sometimes i receive email from my colleagues they say look your uh, meta-analysis is only an association yes is an association but we have also the study in animals that is a cause uh, cause causality is a cause yeah. response so now we have the same knowledge with cannabis that we had 20 years ago with the tobacco tobacco started like that first we had the association studies and then we have studies with the animal in vitro that demonstrated the association between tobacco and cancer and the same things now is happening with the with cannabis, we have a lot of studies that demonstrate the link, but still some scientists still challenge this idea. And, and you'd never ethically be able to actually do that study in humans to take 10,000 perfectly healthy young people and have half of them smoke weed every day mm -hmm. for a year and half of them not and see how many kill themselves like that. You would never be able to do that study. So that's uh, so surprising to me that they can't see the causality because it's it is the studies that you have done that show that yeah wow uh let's see i'm surprised the fact that cannabis is worse than alcohol mm -hmm. uh, for depression and suicidal ideations what was the percentage point difference between the two i think i saw the numbers but i didn't um, write them down this person says oh. Okay, in uh, this is very, very complex question. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say that alcohol and cannabis are two different pharmacological uh, entities. It's like to compare apple and oranges. Everybody has a good things and bad things. So the study that I presented by my colleague uh, Ori, he demonstrated that when you control for genetic factors, Cannabis more than alcohol is associated to suicide. And uh, this is just for this particular study. However, also regarding acute psychosis, there is a huge difference between alcohol and cannabis. Cannabis is as a 500% increase of acute psychosis versus 200% alcohol. Okay. But we know that both alcohol and both cannabis can um, re have a risk for mood disorder, both of them. So I mean, they're different. Alcohol and cannabis can induce mood disorder, but see, it seems cannabis more than alcohol. 
it seems that cannabis more than alcohol induce acute psychosis. So they have different kind of uh, risk depending on the disease. Wow, so complex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when people say, oh, you know, alcohol's worse, why are you so focused on on marijuana? You know, I get emails all the time of people chiding me for uh, focusing on single substance and it's because of the prevalence, the use, the problems that it's causing, but people say, oh, alcohol is so much worse. Um, so it's really good to have this data to yeah. show them uh, the science that yeah. it is much worse with regard to psychosis and suicidality. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. There is a lot, a lot of fake news. A lot of people say, why alcohol and not uh, cannabis? Well, no, are two different entities. Uh, each one produces different bad effects. And again, as I mentioned before, when we think about alcohol and cannabis, we have to think about the same population. People that smoke cannabis also smoke alcohol. There are studies, very beautiful studies done in uh, Harvard about the trajectory of these kids. You have some period, these kids smoke more cannabis. Then the cannabis decreases a little bit, they, they have more alcohol, more tobacco. Then alcohol decreases, they restart cannabis again, high doses. So we are talking about the same group. So we should be very, very careful not to banalize, minimize, the co-dependence, co-abuse of cannabis and alcohol is not a, a trivial problem. And not that alcohol is good by any means. We can show a case study for how much of a failure that is often in our adolescence as well. Yeah. Uh, but it is also true, is it not, that once uh, the high doses of cannabis are used and you mentioned the dopamine, that when a, an adolescent no longer derives the same amount of high and yeah. starts feeling poorly, um, often they may also use other stronger drugs to try yeah. to get that high again. Yeah. Are there studies that talk about the intervening of factors when a high potency cannabis is used, let's say, frequently, and then maybe they might do LSD or uh, take some opioids. Does that make it worse okay. or is it just there the cannabis? Is, there is this a theory as uh, if a cannabis is um, um, a factor for using other drugs, it's called gating theory. It's still controversial in a science, but uh, is it true that uh, to, in particular today people that uh, uh, people who smoke high potency cannabis also have a preference for a psychedelic, so for cocaine, etc. Yes. The science has not yet demonstrated that there is this facilitator effect between cannabis and other drugs. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, how is your team planning to go mainstream with all this information so that more people can learn about it? Um, how do we get articles into mainstream media, for example? Do you just find that they don't want to hear it because they want marijuana to be used more? They don't want to tell the truth in the media and in education and in uh, television? How do we get the word out to our youth and our parents who don't think there's any harm for their children to use it? Um, so that they can hear the real truth of the data that you have found. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. Me, I'm, a, I'm a, a person, so I do my best. But of course, uh, we need the people like uh, Johnny Ambassadors uh, uh, Foundation to, to have more, to bring this new more. If just you Google uh, cannabis, you see all the marvelous effect of oh, cannabis. It's so wonderful, so healing. Someone said we need a Netflix special. Ah, yeah, that's a great idea. I like this. You can be the hero and I'll interview you. How's that? Very, oh, a very nice movie. A movie about this the is effect. Your movie. We, have, yeah. we bring all of our experts and we do a documentary. I think very we should do nice. it. 
Very nice. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we still have a few minutes. Can these products be labeled danger? Why don't they say this can cause depression, this can cause suicidal ideation, this can cause psychosis? How do we get those products to be labeled? I think there was a label in Canada, a warning can cause psychosis in adolescence, and someone said that was removed and in Canada. I know that there was in the proposition of law, there was this warning. I don't know if it was removed. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. In Colorado, where yeah. we passed uh, House Bill 1317 just a couple months ago, regulating marijuana concentrates. So we're very excited wow. about that. We have a lot of legislation left to do. Uh, but one of the things that came out of that bill was a requirement to give uh, people who purchase marijuana products in our dispensaries a flyer yeah. uh, containing warnings. And that is currently being drafted and it is required that it will go into the bag mm -hmm. of every uh, person who purchases a cannabis product. So it seems like that should be a standard practice, especially if it's a nationwide or a federal uh, yeah. legalization. So that's it's a good reminder from what you're telling us that we need to push uh, mm -hmm. to have these warnings standard. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I would like to add, I think that cannabis is not a question of right or left party. I think it doesn't, doesn't exist a prohibition or full legalization. We need really good laws, good laws yeah. that regulates advertisement, concentration of ETHC, Product, important point. Very, very important. The age of consumption, the quantity weekly that we can use. We need uh, intelligent laws. We need uh, intelligent regulation, not just uh, leave uh, political parties uh, to decide on the on our, our health, the health of our future generations. Very great point. And, and to not have those decisions being made by the cannabis industry uh, themselves, yeah. because they are motivated to addict our children as young as possible so they can profit uh, from that. And I know you were involved in the effort to, uh, to raise the age here in Colorado in medically, you can use marijuana starting at 18, which is very problematic. Uh, versus it, it, where you are, I think, did you raise it to 21? 21, yes. So yeah. In Quebec, the law passed until 21, yes. At least. And I know in other parts of Canada, it's still 18. Still 18. Uh, good for you for sharing that. And we have, you're right, we're not going to be able to put the horse back in the barn, so to speak, but we have to put guardrails in place to protect yeah. uh, our most vulnerable citizens, our, our adolescents. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what about the brain? Someone is asking here about the brain um, being arrested, the, the cortices being yeah. affected. So, um, they read that the adolescent becomes stuck uh, at the age of their first use. Is that uh, something that you know about? When no, they no, 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 not like that. So what I explain is that uh, the adolescent brain develop first on the back in the limbic system, emotion, and only later in 20s, the prefrontal cortex, that is the rationality, moral values, decision, etc. So what happened is that cannabis interfere with this emotional brain during adolescence. So probably the regulation of emotions, the development of emotion are dysregulated under cannabis consumption. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. But there is a good thing. So there is a good thing. So there are a few papers, a few scientific papers say if adolescents stop early, start at 14, stop at 17, the possibility of recovering are very high. That's this is important. Very, very encouraging. It's very encouraging. And to be able to communicate that to a child who's having problems that it's not too late. You can stop now and there can be improvement. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 
What treatments are available? Um, someone's asking about the benzo and the gabapentin. We've, we've not heard of that as a treatment for cannabis withdrawal um, here in the US. How long do they need to stay on those uh, medications to help them get over uh, cannabis addiction? Uh, it's, very, it's very variable, this. Uh, you can't really say. The case that I present, Jacques, stay only for a few months, three, four months. Other people stay to be longer and then uh, tapering down the doses uh, very slowly. It's very subjective. Okay, yes. And Johnny was using an antipsychotic, but unfortunately he stopped taking it unbeknownst to us, thinking that he was better. Yeah. Um, so that has to be done under careful supervision yeah. and, and over time. Uh, to make sure that it's uh, not too too sudden as well. And I mentioned with benzos, you have to be careful then that they don't become addicted to the benzos. <laughs> yes, yes so absolutely. That sounds like it could be um, tricky as well. Um, okay, one more question. We only have one more minute. What would you suggest is the continuum of care uh, after someone is uh, being treated for cannabis? Do they go home or do you recommend a residential um, type of situation for a time? Uh, good question. Depend uh, where the person uh, lives. For example, uh, in uh, Europe, in Italy, where I know well, we have a lot of residential community for young people, then mm -hmm. where people can stay months uh, before a complete recovery. In, uh, in Canada, the residential um, uh, structure for uh, addiction of cannabis are very few. So it's very difficult for us uh, to send the young patients in this uh, residential uh, community. That's too bad. So, we yeah. have that here too. It's just hit and miss, very inconsistent uh, and, and problematic. It's very difficult for the parent to find the, the proper treatment uh, and not Every doctor even believes the cannabis, of course, is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We should yeah. send them all over to Europe so they can yeah, yeah. go, <laughs> go no, over I'm, there. I'm very always very surprised at uh, uh, the different system, health system that we have uh, between North America and Europe, especially for addiction, especially for addiction. Well, Dr. Gabi, we are out of time. The rest of the comments are all. Thank you, doctor. Excellent presentation. Great. Love your honesty. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will echo all of those kind responses. Your um, time and talent and experience is so much appreciated. And thank you for giving thank to you. us here at Johnny's Ambassadors, Dr. Gabi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.